Welcome to Sunland Talks. I'm Helen Edmonds. Uh, today we're discussing vaccinations with Dr. Sophie Hodgetts. Sophie is a lecturer in psychology and has an active research interest in the field of cognitive neuroscience. Hi. <laughs> um, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about um, your research, things that you're interested in. Yeah, sure. So my primary research interest is in biological psychology. Um, so my PhD was on cognitive neuroscience and for that I did research on the role of sex hormones and how they affect the brain, how they affect behaviour, um, all that kind of thing. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so you're joining us today to discuss the, the debate about um, vaccinations, so, which is back in the press again, um, following a, a growing outbreak of measles, which seems mm. to have come back. And when I was doing a little bit of kind of prep for this podcast, I was thinking... Um, we've been here before. I remember kind of in the 90s and the early 2000s, the, the big sort of media story was about the link between the MMR vaccine mm-hmm. and autism. And you've written a blog quite recently about um, sort of the anti-vaxxers, as they're called, so the people who don't believe in vaccinations. And you kind of uh, wrote about the, the MMR vaccine and the, the autism link, um, that story back from the 90s. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the blog that, uh, that you wrote and um, why you wrote it, because mm-hmm. uh, uh, you, you mentioned before we started recording that you had a lecture that week. If you could just tell us a little bit about yeah, that lecture so and how that linked um, in. I teach on a module called Psychology in the Media and one of the lectures that I do for that module is essentially a case study of the MMR vaccine um, and how that story started, the research that sort of prompted it and then essentially how the media was at least in part responsible for the story kind of snowballing and having an effect on people in their real day-to-day lives and how it's still affecting us today because like you said we're still talking about it and we're still having this debate um so the title of the blog was literally we've been here before yeah um i think we call it science is groundhog day or something like that yeah um because It keeps coming back and like I said before we started recording, like the fact that we're still talking about this is pretty mind boggling um, given that the research is pretty conclusive now that vaccines are safe. Um, So the story that that always comes up is, or the belief that always comes up is that vaccines are not safe and that they're linked to autism in children. So the reason why it's specifically linked to autism supposedly was because a study came out in 1998 by Andrew Wakefield. Um, It wasn't only him, he was on a team of researchers. And essentially they looked at 12 kids, there was a series of case studies of 12 kids who developed behavioral problems after having been given the MMR vaccine. Um, And he was interested in the link between having the vaccine, the onset of a series of symptoms related to like gastrointestinal problems and autism. And I believe the argument was that they'd been given the MMR vaccine in the combined vaccination rather than as separate and that that had caused some kind of internal issue with their digestive systems that had caused autism to develop, broadly speaking. Um, The research has since been discredited uh, quite a number of times. to cut kind of a long story short, Andrew Wakefield was eventually struck off the medical register. He could no longer practice in this country. Um, the paper was retracted for various reasons, primarily that he was found to have fixed and manipulated the data um, to make effects look present that weren't actually there. And um, he'd also behaved unethically with these kids. So he'd collected data from them that he did not have informed consent from either the parents or the kids. Um, there was evidence that he'd paid for things like blood samples. Um, one story that we see come up a few times when you talk about Andrew Wakefield and the investigation by the General Medical Council is that he organised kids to come to his, I think it was his son's birthday party, and he took blood samples from them oh, wow. at the birthday party <laughs> and like paid the parents £5, I believe, for each sample, which is grossly unethical. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> It's just it, it is quite interesting how people sort of they bought into the story mm-hmm. um, and that's kind of a combination of I mean if, if you see sort of science report in the press quite often you, you will read the story and especially if it's something that might interest you or you mm-hmm. you know if, if parents had concerns about their own children they might have 
read that story with, with great interest. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how this particular story was kind of a combination of bad signs, which you've kind of already covered, mm -hmm. um, but also the ill-researched reporting in, in the press. And obviously the yeah. module that you teach on psychology in the media is about how sort of scientific reporting in the press can sometimes be pr problematic sometimes. Um, yeah. So if you could tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I think problematic is quite a, a polite way of putting it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm probably not allowed to mention any names, right, of like newspapers that are particularly well known for, yeah, <laughs> for um, bad science reporting. Um, <laughs> we could probably surmise. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a handful that are particularly well known. Uh, but with the MMR case, what's interesting to us really is that initially it wasn't that big of a story in the news. Um, it was only covered by a handful of newspapers, which I think is kind of interesting because it was published in a pretty good uh, journal. It was published in The Lancet, the original paper. Um, it wasn't until Andrew Wakefield started doing press conferences um, and speaking to parents who they thought had, you know, their children had changed after they'd had the vaccine that it really started to take off mm -hmm. so um, the book that I referred to in the lecture is Bad Science by Ben Goldacre and I recommend everybody read that book mm -hmm. if you've got any interest in science at all mm -hmm. um, and he referred to the process as being almost science by press conference rather than science by reading peer-reviewed journal articles so I think the reason that, that the first reason really that the that the story really took off was because those press conferences were very emotional environments. So lots of kind of inflammatory statements were being made. There was parents who were, you know, in support of Andrew Wakefield and there was all these sort of emotional anecdotes about how their children had had changed behaviorally after they'd had the vaccine. Um, and those make for very powerful persuasive arguments. So having that emotional component um, behind whatever message it is that you're trying to get across makes it very persuasive and it makes it very powerful and it makes it very difficult to argue against mm -hmm. as well so I think that was one factor that, that really started it to, to snowball after that it started to pick up more and more coverage by newspapers in the press um, and eventually ended up with a sort of unwitting celebrity endorsement so one of the things that we also talk about in the in the module and specifically in that lecture is this idea that having a celebrity face on your message has the potential to make it a very powerful message mm -hmm. so th the kind of unwitting celebrity in this case was leo blair yeah um, so this was tony but tony and sheree blair's uh, baby at the time and that was sort of put in the spotlight by the media because he was of that age where he was eligible to have the mmr vaccine um, but the Blairs kind of refused to comment on it. They wouldn't say that he had had it and they wouldn't say that he hadn't. And that sort of vagueness, that ambiguity around that makes people think, well, if these people are not going to you know, put their face or put their backing towards the vaccine and its safety, then I'm not going to either. Why should I get my kid vaccine, like, vaccinated if it's, if it's not good enough for them? Yeah. Um, so that was really one of the things that sort of helped it to snowball and is still something that we see quite a lot in the anti-vaccination movement that we see today and is kind of one of the reasons why we're still talking about it is because we still have you know celebrities from this country and others that argue that vaccines aren't safe for whatever reason yeah so i think in the um in the blog that you wrote you referenced kath on d yeah, um she was one of the people uh, or one of the kind of celebrities that, that we know in our time now um who's against um vaccinations um and i think she she'd sort of written a post on instagram i think like for how, how strongly she felt about mm -hmm. not giving her i think unborn child at the time i don't know how yeah. long ago the, the instagram post was um she felt very strongly about not giving her child uh, mm -hmm. vaccinations yeah so that was one of the things that i think was one example of yeah. the story coming back into mm -hmm. into the spotlight for <laughs> again um so she had posted on her Instagram, now I'm sure all of us know who Kat Von D is yeah. and mm -hmm. we all know that she's um, a beauty guru, she does tattooing, um, she's quite known for her sort of cruelty free vegan lifestyle so she doesn't like uh, drugs, alcohol, uh, animal based products, all that kind of thing and one of the reasons why her beauty brand is so big is because it prides itself on being uh, cruelty free and vegan. Yeah. 
that sort of lifestyle to some extent is associated with the anti-vax movement so I think some people weren't surprised when she came out and said that she was going to be raising her child sort of naturally um, in what in a way that she perceives as being really healthy and that means to her not having vaccinations um, which is obviously problematic and sort of started a bit of a storm online as well yeah um, with people who were for that idea or sort of agreed with what she was endorsing and people who weren't um, it did seem to divide people and there was a lot of coverage and sort of on YouTube and on social media of other you know influencers or beauty gurus boycotting her brand because they don't want to endorse that um, but on the flip side it for the people who already are thinking that vaccinations are harmful um, for whatever reason, they see that as an endorsement of their beliefs, that this person who we look to for being sort of a, a guide or someone who's knowledgeable about how to live in a healthy, natural kind of way, yeah. she doesn't think we should be doing vaccines, so therefore mm. we're not going to do it either. Yeah, so just reinforces that yeah. belief. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Because um, I, I do find it interesting that even though, you know, the, the whole MMR um, equals autism story mm, mm, mm. um that it was debunked um you know it, it had huge press coverage but also mm. the debunking of it had press coverage as well mm. but somehow we still remember the the actual story coming out not necessarily it being yeah uh, you know mm. i can't think of a better word than debunked mm. um yeah we seem to still re remember that story i just find that um quite interesting it has it has come back and um, it just seems to to keep coming back as a debate um, mm. and and in November, um, one of the things again that you wrote in your blog um, was about a debate on Good Morning Britain, mm. which is between a mother who um, believed that her child, who was too young for the vaccine at the time, had caught measles from another child, which mm. she believed hadn't had the vaccine. Um, the other person in the debate was a mother who didn't believe in vaccines, and then Dr. Hilary Jones as well, who's um, Good Morning Britain's kind of. Um, resident doctor yeah. um, who, who contributes to uh, kind of their health coverage um, so, so this, is, this is something that was in the press recently so what, why is the debate around vaccinations a thing like why what is it about this particular thing that keeps drawing us back mm. in um, and it, sort of it, even people who believe in vaccinations were drawn into why people are against them mm. and why do you think that is so I think there's a couple of reasons I think one reason is obviously the celebrity endorsement so whenever a celebrity comes out as saying they're for vaccinations or they're against vaccinations it drags up all of this stuff so we know that the reason why people are saying they're for or against is because of the debate so it keeps bringing it back up so it's almost like a circular argument like we keep talking about it because people keep talking about it for yeah. whatever reason um, it makes for a good story. Uh, it's very emotional, like I said. Um, it ap affects people's real lives. It plays on their concerns. And I think part of the reason why the story initially was so... Uh, ended up being covered so extensively was because of the emotional stories that were presented by the news. So generally, when we report about science in the media or when the media reports about science and research it's not general journalists that do it it's spe like specialist science uh, oriented journalists who've had some kind of training or they're used to working with uh, researchers and academics that didn't happen in the case of the MMR vaccine so it was people who had no background in science and who weren't used to engaging in academic talk and jargon and all that kind of thing presenting this stuff in the media that meant that researchers themselves weren't really being spoken to instead it was parents that were being spoken to so the parents are presenting their stories which obviously are easier for people to understand but also like I said incredibly emotional um, quite effective in making something quite persuasive and making it stick really yeah uh, making it very difficult to argue against um, I think another reason we keep talking about it is or another reason why the message is so persuasive is because of this psychological process known as confirmation bias, which is the idea that we like to look for evidence that supports what we already think. And we tend to do that with almost this tunnel vision type of, uh, of process. So if we already think that, you know, vaccinations are bad, you're going to selectively only look for information that supports your idea that vaccines are bad. Now that information can come from pretty much anywhere. Um, 
Facebook is quite a good example. Um, a lot of online forums tends to be like 10 minutes on Google. If you're searching for evidence that vaccines are bad, you'll find loads of stuff. Yeah. Not necessarily from a science background, but from, again, stories from other people who have been affected by this. Um, and that's part of the reason why it keeps coming back up. And I think that's part of the reason why, even on things like Good Morning Britain, that's why they were still having that debate. Although I think calling it a debate was maybe a bit generous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a lot, lot of shouting. A lot of shouting very quickly, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the great thing about psychology as um, a discipline, as a, as a subject, mm. is that the one thing, like I'm a psychology graduate, and the one thing it taught me was about um, critical thinking skills and mm. about questioning things. Mm. So if you, you know, if, if you possibly haven't, if you're not thinking critically and you just read something at face value, mm. you, you know, you may well get get kind of sucked in and think oh yeah this, this is the truth this is mm. this is what's going on but I think psychology taught me to kind of go hang on let, let's have a look and, and I actually studied the module psychology um, in the media mm. and it, it, it does teach you to sort of question and say is this real where, where has this research come from and, yeah. and you know it, it may well be that the, the, the story might have been reported very well in the press and has, has had lots of um, like thorough research and experts who've contributed and that's fine and um, I think it's just having that awareness to to read it and, and question say you know let, let's have a little look at this and actually what you can do is if you if you have access you can actually look d deeper into it mm. so if you see a new story reporting something scientific you, you can go in have a little bit of a look in journal articles and to, yeah, to, and to confirm whether it is um, it's always worth looking like who is actually saying this stuff and where are they getting their information so yeah look at who's reporting it um what's their background is there any risk of them you know not understanding the mm -hmm. stuff that they're talking about what sort of qualifications do they have have they cited the original material mm -hmm. can you then go back to the original material and see if what's being presented there actually matches what's being said yeah um particularly in the press um but i think a lot of what we do on in psychology and like particularly for psychology in the media because it's on our stage one uh year group um is it's about encouraging the students to be aware of these potential cognitive errors that you can make because everybody makes them we all have them um, confirmation bias is one um, having stereotypes and schemas are another um, all of these sorts of things exist for a reason but they're not perfect they are mm -hmm. you know they can go wrong sometimes yeah. um, and I think being aware of those things is the first step in encouraging yourself to be to think critically about stuff yeah. whether it's in the media or if it's in a peer-reviewed journal article we should be questioning things and yeah. you know coming to our own judgments based on the evidence yeah and I think I think the awareness thing's really key because yeah I think even if you read a headline and you automatically think oh my oh my god uh -huh. some, you know something terrible's happened it's just taking a step back and going hang on has something terrible happened you know yes it's, it's fine to have that reaction but mm. actually taking that step back and and, and and having a think and about I think it. being being aware of that as well like remember the like the point of a headline is to be shocking and it is to draw you yeah. in there's a good chance that what's in the headline and then what's in the the small print essentially isn't necessarily going to match up totally yeah um and to be fair we do see that sometimes in journal articles as well like in peer-reviewed articles sometimes the title of a paper is a bit misleading mm -hmm. um so it's always worth going beyond that beyond the abstract and actually thinking well you've said this particular thing in your conclusion, but think critically about it, look at the results, do the results actually go with what the author is saying in the conclusion? Because that's not always the case. Yeah. Um, and much like, I mean, because cognitive errors are a thing that happen, peer review isn't a flawless process either. So mm -hmm. not everything that gets published is perfect. Mm -hmm. Not everything, I mean, for example, the Andrew Wakefield's original paper, we know that it wasn't perfect. We know now that a lot of the data was manipulated, a lot of yeah. values were fixed. Um, even beyond the the unethical side of things yeah um so it's always worth doing doing your own research i yeah. suppose it is, it's an ongoing process research yeah. uh -huh. um that's kind of the, the key thing about it it, mm -hmm. it is ongoing and we we keep trying to to find out more and yeah which, which is good you know yeah. we don't want to reach a point where we go well we've we've found out everything there is to know yeah <laughs> that's that's the end of research totally so <laughs> um no it is it is good to keep that going you mentioned a couple of minutes ago about facebook and, mm. and online forums and how that's a great place for things to grow and, and, and snowball and i was reading an article recently it came out in sort of 
I think last week, week before, about Facebook being under pressure to halt the rise of anti-vaccination groups. Mm. It was a, um, a Guardian article. And um, it covered how on Facebook you could create closed groups and the, there's a couple of anti-vaccination groups on Facebook. Um, so they promote the idea of not vaccinating children. So this article was, was covering the fact that some health experts are calling for these um, close groups to be shut down. They were calling on Facebook to, mm-hmm. to kind of do more, so to speak, to, to close them down or, or to at least monitor them more closely. Um, so one of the pharmaceutical, uh, sorry, one of the health experts was um, kind of made the point that pharmaceutical companies are... Um, they're not allowed to promote misinformation about things. You know, obviously their their research has to be well backed up uh, before they can say, "Oh, these these pills mm-hmm. do whatever." Um, so they would try to say, "Why is this allowed?" Because um, you know these groups have got hundreds, thousands of people um, on them. So it's kind of an example of um, an echo chamber, and echo chambers um, kind of a buzzword that's um, in the media at the moment. Um, you know. For, for important reasons so I thought we would take kind of a sidestep a little away from the vaccinations and, and, and just look at from um, a psychology point of view what are echo chambers and why do we like to hear opinions similar to our own from like-minded people mm. so there's a I think there's a couple of reasons why this sort of thing happens um, so it's something that has been studied particularly by social psychologists for a very long time and I think to me, an echo chamber is almost what we would refer to in social psychology as an example of groupthink. Yeah. And groupthink is one of my favourite terms in psychology because <laughs> it sounds so Orwellian. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, it sounds so 1984, um, which is horrifying given today's world. Yeah. Uh, but it's we'll an example. We'll that for another podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be much longer, I think. <laughs> but it's, I think it's almost an example of groupthink. And groupthink is this idea that when you're surrounded by people focused on one particular message or on one particular task, they focus on it to the exclusion of everything else. So they become so focused and so tunnel visioned, a bit like when we looked at confirmation bias as well. Um, And there's lots of different cognitive processes that feed into why an echo chamber is so effective. Why does groupthink happen? Um, One thing that we could say is it's potentially to do with social identity theory. So social identity theory essentially states that we like people who are similar to us and we seek to fit in with certain groups because they're similar to us, they help us to shape our identity, they've got similar traits, similar values, um, similar behaviours, similar likes, dislikes, that kind of thing. So when we talk about people who are anti-vaxxers or who are against vaccinations, that tends to conjure up a particular image of the sort of person that that might be like. Um, So if we use Kat Von D as the example, she's vegan, she's all natural, sort of almost hippie-like in her beliefs and in her behaviours, that's going to appeal to other people who also share those values. So it becomes almost a bubble where everything that fits with that sort of mindset or fits with that set of values is allowed into the bubble but nothing else is. So again, confirmation bias. We seek the sort of evidence to support the things that we already think. Um, And I think that is quite risky, um, particularly where things like Facebook are concerned. And I think more so risky where Facebook's concerned because of the way that Facebook works, and not just Facebook, but social media in general. The way their algorithms work is to tie you to things that they think you're going to like. So if you join an anti-vax Facebook group, for example, you'll probably be recommended other anti-vax groups yeah or other people will start popping up in the people you may know section that are in those groups as well and it sort of spirals and spirals and snowballs and i think that's a bit risky yeah but on the flip side can we really tell people well you shouldn't be making these facebook groups i mean there's an argument that people should be allowed to do whatever they want on facebook because Mm -hmm. or on social media in general or say whatever you like on social media um Obviously, we see that backfire all the time with people getting fired for saying stuff on Twitter in particular. Um, But I think there is an argument and there is a debate to be had there about whether or not we should be allowing this because, for me, the big thing with the anti-vax movement and why I feel so passionately about it is that it's not only you that it's affecting, it's harmful. Like The anti-vax movement is harmful to other people on a whole range of levels. Um, It's putting other people at risk, like physically at risk, um, 
one thing that I, I didn't touch on so much in the blog, but that I do talk about in the lecture is the big problem with the MMR vaccine and the link to autism is it makes out as if having autism is this awful, terrible <laughs> thing that yeah. no parent would ever want their child to have. Mm -hmm. But getting measles, bumps or rubella is worth the risk of your child having autism. And I just, yeah, I think that does so much for the stigma and for the stereotypes and the sorts of discrimination that people with autism experience because it gets painted in the media as being this awful thing that nobody wants and I don't think that's that's fair and it's not something that necessarily is considered by people who support the anti-vax movement yeah um, but having a child with autism is not as bad as <laughs> as having a child who has measles or the outcomes of that which yeah. are not particularly pleasant <laughs> no not uh, indeed um, I mean we, we were sort of d discussing out, outside of um, recording about with vaccinations is it is it a privilege to reject them mm. and say I don't want my child to have um, vaccinations whereas because we live in a part of the world where we have quite a few vaccinations against um, various um, mm. diseases um, you know we're very lucky we're very privileged to have them so therefore is it, is it sort of a western privilege for us to, to um, I, I use the royal us, obviously not not me and you, Sophie. <laughs> um, to, to for people to reject uh, vaccinations. Yeah, I think there is an element of privilege there for sure. Um, although I don't know if privilege is the right word to use because mm. I think that has been taken out of context in many instances these days. Mm. Um, but it is something not that not everybody can afford to do, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's it's difficult to argue with people who are so vehemently anti-vax is because of this this sort of twist in the logic that well it's my right it's my choice if I don't want to vaccinate my child but when you argue that well actually by not doing that you're putting other people's children at risk they will counter that by saying well if vaccines work what are you so worried about and the argument there is like we all know that herd immunity is a thing so yeah herd, the reason why vaccines work is because the majority of the population need to be vaccinated yeah. for it to work. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think it is a privilege because there are people who, for whatever, who for very obvious reasons or for very valid reasons, can't have the vaccine. So the MMR, for example, you have to be a certain age before you have that vaccine. Um, other vaccines, there are ingredients in them that some people are allergic to, so they can't have the vaccine. Mm -hmm. They are relying on the majority of other people getting vaccinated to protect them from disease. So I do think there is an element of privilege. Um, and I wonder if that sometimes ties in with why the anti-vax movement is so popular in America, where they still have to pay for vaccines as well. Um, obviously, their healthcare system is very different to us. Mm -hmm. But the anti-vax movement over there is huge um, because it's sort of founded on this idea of it's my right to choose. I don't want to pad big farmers' bottom line with my money um, for a vaccine that my child doesn't need. And yeah. that is particularly dangerous, I think. And again, that's part of the reason, I think, why the anti-vax message continues to be a thing because undermining so-called experts or people that are in authority is another way of making the message extremely persuasive yeah so yeah that did seem to be when i was reading th this particular article about the the facebook groups it, mm. the big message that they seem to be sharing is that they didn't want to give um pharmaceutical companies money yeah. um and i think it's sort of, it was almost like the, the the message of why you vaccinate your children had got lost somewhere yeah and that argument i always find it's it's a fascinating logical fallacy almost mm. because when you weigh up the cost of a vaccine it's i think what about 15 dollars or so for a vaccine versus the cost of hospitalizing your child because they've contracted measles that's up in the tens of thousands of dollars so why would big pharma be pushing a vaccine that is potentially a lot cheaper <laughs> yeah then <laughs> mm -hmm. let's just let everyone have measles and we'll make loads of money off it like I don't yeah no <laughs> it doesn't make sense <laughs> no, it does not. <laughs> I've sort of come to the end of my questions, but I didn't know if there's anything you wanted us to cover that we haven't already covered, uh, any points that you wanted to make. I don't think so. Um, vaccinate your kids, <laughs> please. <laughs> Hashtag. Yeah, vaccinate your damn kids. <laughs> well, thank you very much for today. No problem. It's been Thanks a really interesting discussion. <laughs>